On February 19, 1982, in the quiet suburban town of Brighton, New York, a horrific crime shocked the city. Kathy Krausneck, a 29-year-old mother, was found brutally murdered in her own home. The discovery was made by her husband, James Krausneck, when he returned from work in the late afternoon. Kathy's body was found in the bed they shared, with an ax lodged deeply into her head. The Krausneck family had recently moved to Brighton for James's new job as an economist at Kodak. On that fateful day, James claimed to have left for work early in the morning. James returned home and was met with a scene of unimaginable horror. Upon entering the house, James immediately noticed something was wrong. The garage door was ajar, and a window between the garage and the house was broken. As he ventured inside, he found the lifeless body of his wife in their bed, an ax embedded in her head. Shocked and speechless, he hurriedly took his daughter to a neighbor's house to ensure her safety and called for help. The police arrived promptly and began their investigation. The crime scene presented a puzzling picture. There were no signs of forced entry apart from the broken window. Additionally, despite the appearance of a disturbed home, nothing of value was stolen, ruling out robbery as a motive. This gruesome discovery sent shockwaves through the neighborhood. Kathy Krausneck's brutal murder and the mysterious circumstances surrounding it left the police and the community searching for answers. Over the next decades, this case would unfold into a complex investigation, leading to a controversial and debated conclusion. As we begin to unravel the events of that tragic day, the focus remains on the chilling and unresolved questions that continue to haunt those involved in the investigation and the lives it forever changed. On the afternoon of February 19, 1982, James Krausnick entered the Brighton police station holding his three-year-old daughter, Sarah. Her hands were smeared with blood and James was visibly shaken. He reported that he had found his wife, Kathy, dead in their home. According to James, he had been at work all day at Kodak, where he worked as an economist. Kathy had planned to stay home with their daughter. James explained that he had left for work that morning. When he returned home, he immediately noticed something was wrong. He ventured inside, where he found Kathy lying in their bed with an ax embedded in her head. Overwhelmed by the sight, he was momentarily speechless. His priority was to ensure Sarah's safety, so he quickly took her to a neighbor's house and asked them to call the police. The police arrived shortly after receiving the call. The initial examination of the crime scene revealed no signs of forced entry, apart from the broken window. The ax used in the murder was found to be from the Krausenex garage. Strangely, there were no fingerprints on the weapon or anywhere else in the house, suggesting that the perpetrator had meticulously cleaned the entire scene. Despite the apparent disturbance in the house, nothing of value was taken. Valuables, including money and jewelry, were left untouched. Items like a tea set and silverware were found neatly arranged, which was unusual for a burglary. During the investigation, the police interviewed young Sarah. She told them she had seen a bad, colorful person in her parents' bed. It was likely her way of describing her mother, given the blood and the traumatic scene she had witnessed. This added a layer of complexity to the case, as it suggested that Sarah might have been present during or shortly after the murder. The lack of fingerprints, the staged appearance of the home, and the absence of any stolen items made the investigation challenging. The police began to gather information about the Krausenek family and their background to find any possible leads. Friends and neighbors described James and Kathy as a perfect couple. Despite the initial portrayal of a happy family, the police dug deeper into their situation. They found a flyer in James's car that advertised solutions for family problems, indicating potential marital issues. James's colleagues at Kodak reported that he had been acting strangely at work and had problems due to his lack of skills. These revelations painted a different picture and raised suspicions about James's involvement in the crime. James Krausneck provided a detailed account of his day to the police. He stated that he left their home at 6.30 a.m. on February 19, 1982, to go to his job at Kodak. According to James, Kathy was alive and well when he departed, planning to spend the day at home with their daughter, Sarah. James described his routine at work, noting that it was a typical day without any unusual occurrences. Upon returning home around 5 p.m., James immediately sensed that something was wrong. The garage door was open, and the window between the garage and the house was broken. As he entered the house, 
he found the lifeless body of his wife in their bed, with an ax embedded in her head. Overcome with shock and fear, James's first instinct was to ensure the safety of their daughter, Sarah. He quickly took her to a neighbor's house and asked them to call the police. James was visibly distraught when he arrived at the police station with Sarah, her hands smeared with her mother's blood. James initially cooperated fully with the police investigation. He answered their questions and provided a detailed timeline of his day. His demeanor was one of shock and grief, and he appeared eager to help the authorities in any way he could. However, despite his cooperation, the police needed more information to rule him out as a suspect. A few days later, the police scheduled a second interrogation with James to gather more details and clarify some points from his initial statement. However, James did not show up for the appointment. Instead, he left the city to visit his parents. While this raised some suspicions, the police considered the possibility that James needed the support of his family during this traumatic time. The police eventually tracked James to his parents' home, where they conducted another interview. During this session, James provided blood and hair samples as part of the investigation. Although DNA testing was not available at the time, the samples were taken for potential future use. James continued to maintain his innocence and reiterated his account of the events on the day of the murder. Ten days after Kathy's death, James hired a lawyer. This move added another layer of complexity to the investigation. The presence of legal counsel meant that James's interactions with the police would now be more controlled and strategic. Despite this, James continued to assert his innocence and expressed a desire to see the real perpetrator brought to justice. Throughout this period, James's emotional state was closely observed by both the police and his neighbors. He appeared to be deeply affected by the loss of his wife, showing signs of distress and grief. However, his decision to leave town shortly after the murder and his subsequent actions raised questions among the investigators. These actions were scrutinized in the context of the case, as the police sought to determine whether they were consistent with the behavior of a grieving husband or if they suggested something more sinister. The initial stages of the investigation were marked by these conflicting impressions of James. On one hand, he was a cooperative and grieving husband, devastated by the loss of his wife. On the other hand, his actions and some aspects of his story raised suspicions that the police could not ignore. As the investigation progressed, these early impressions of James would continue to influence the direction of the case, shaping the perceptions of both the investigators and the public. The complexity of James's behavior and the circumstances surrounding Kathy's murder presented a significant challenge for the police. They needed to balance the emotional and psychological aspects of the case with the hard evidence they were gathering this delicate balance would prove to be a central theme in the ongoing investigation, as the police worked to uncover the truth behind the tragic events of February 19, 1982. The initial forensic analysis of the crime scene provided some critical yet inconclusive information. The autopsy conducted shortly after Kathy Krausnick's death indicated that she had died between 2.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. on February 19, 1982. This broad time frame left open the possibility that either James or an unknown assailant could have committed the crime. The medical examiner noted that Kathy had been struck with a single fatal blow to the head with an ax while she was in bed. At the time, forensic technology was limited. Deoxyribonucleic acid analysis, which is now a cornerstone of criminal investigations, was not available in 1982. As a result, investigators had to rely on more traditional methods of crime scene analysis. The absence of fingerprints on the murder weapon and throughout the house suggested that the killer had gone to great lengths to avoid leaving any traceable evidence. This meticulous cleaning pointed to a perpetrator who was either very cautious or familiar with forensic procedures. The lack of physical evidence, combined with the staged appearance of the crime scene, complicated the investigation. The police collected hair and blood samples from James Krausnick, but without the ability to perform DNA testing, these samples provided limited immediate value. The crime scene itself, with its apparent lack of struggle and the orderly arrangement of household items, suggested that the crime had been carefully planned and executed. Years passed without significant progress in the case. It wasn't until 2015, when advancements in forensic science prompted a re-examination of the evidence that new insights began to emerge. 
Dr. Michael Baden, a renowned forensic pathologist, was brought in to review the case. Dr. Baden's expertise and access to modern forensic techniques provided an opportunity to reevaluate the circumstances surrounding Kathy's death. Dr. Baden conducted a thorough review of the original autopsy report and considered additional factors that had not been fully analyzed in 1982. One critical element he examined was the presence of an electric blanket on the bed where Kathy was found. The blanket had been turned on and Dr. Baden theorized that this could have affected the estimation of the time of death by taking into account the potential impact of the electric blanket on Kathy's body temperature, Dr. Baden concluded that Kathy likely died around 6.30 a.m. This new estimation of the time of death directly contradicted James's alibi, as he had claimed to have left the house at 6.30 a.m. Dr. Baden's analysis suggested that Kathy had been killed shortly before or around the time James was supposedly leaving for work. This crucial piece of evidence reignited suspicions about James's involvement in the murder. Dr. Baden's findings were based on the most current forensic techniques and methodologies available in 2015. He used advanced tools to reassess the state of Kathy's body and the conditions in the bedroom. His conclusions added a new layer of complexity to the case, challenging the initial assumptions made by the investigators in 1982. The reanalysis conducted by Dr. Baden was a significant development in the ongoing investigation it provided a more precise time frame for Kathy's death and cast doubt on James's account of his activities on the morning of the murder. The updated forensic analysis prompted law enforcement to revisit other aspects of the case, including the original crime scene photos, witness statements, and previous leads that had been followed. Despite these advancements, the case remained challenging. The new findings needed to be corroborated with additional evidence to build a stronger case against James, or to identify another potential suspect. The forensic re-examination underscored the importance of continuous advancements in science and technology in solving cold cases and highlighted the difficulties faced by investigators working with limited resources and information. As the investigation moved forward, the insights provided by Dr. Baden played a crucial role in shaping the subsequent legal proceedings. His expert testimony and the updated forensic analysis became key components in the efforts to finally resolve the mystery surrounding Kathy Krausneck's tragic death. As the investigation into Kathy Krausneck's murder progressed, suspicions began to mount against her husband, James. Initially, friends and neighbors had described James and Kathy as the quintessential couple. They had met in school, fallen in love, and married while attending college in 1974. Their daughter, Sarah, was born in 1978 adding joy to their lives. James started his career as a university teacher, which reflected his academic inclination and dedication to education. In 1981, the Krauseneck family relocated to Brighton, New York, after James secured a position as an economist at Kodak. The move was seen as a positive step for the family, offering new opportunities and stability. However, behind the facade of a perfect family, there were subtle signs of trouble, Friends noticed a change in Kathy's behavior about six months before her death. She became more reserved and seemed to be dealing with personal issues, although she did not confide in anyone about the specifics. The police investigation uncovered more details that cast doubt on James's portrayal of their family life. A flyer found in James's car advertised solutions for family problems, suggesting that there might have been underlying marital issues. This discovery, combined with reports from James's colleagues, painted a different picture. At work, James had been acting strangely and had problems due to his lack of skills, which could have added stress to his personal life. James's behavior after the murder also raised eyebrows. While he initially cooperated with the police, his actions soon became a point of concern. He missed a second interrogation and left the city to visit his parents. This decision was seen as suspicious by some, even though the police considered it a natural response to trauma. Furthermore, Hiring a lawyer 10 days after Kathy's death made some question whether he had something to hide. Despite these suspicions, there was another potential suspect who complicated the case. Edward Larrabee, a convicted sex offender, lived near the Krausenecks at the time of Kathy's murder. Larrabee had a long criminal history, including multiple assaults on women. In 2014, shortly before his death in prison, Larrabee confessed to killing Kathy. 
However, his confession was filled with inconsistencies and false details, making it unreliable. For example, he described Kathy inaccurately and provided a timeline that didn't match the known facts of the case. Larrabee's confession was not entirely dismissed, but it did not provide the solid evidence needed to shift the focus away from James. The police had to consider all possibilities, including the chance that Larrabee might be using the confession to gain some form of advantage, as he had done with other crimes. This created a dilemma for the investigators, as they had to weigh the credibility of Larrabee's claims against the suspicious circumstances surrounding James. The investigation into Kathy's murder was further complicated by the community's divided opinions. Some believed James was innocent and a victim of unfortunate circumstances, while others were convinced of his guilt. This division was reflected in the ongoing efforts to gather more evidence and make a conclusive case. Despite the challenges, the police continued to explore every lead. They re-examined the crime scene, revisited witness statements, and looked for any additional evidence that could point to the true perpetrator. The involvement of a high-profile forensic pathologist like Dr. Michael Baden added credibility to the reanalysis of the case, but it also underscored the need for solid, corroborative evidence. As the years went by, the lack of definitive answers left the Krausnet case shrouded in mystery. The investigators faced the daunting task of piecing together a coherent narrative from the fragmented evidence and conflicting testimonies. Each potential lead had to be scrutinized thoroughly, and every hypothesis needed to be tested against the available facts. James's life after Kathy's death continued to be scrutinized. In 1997, he met Sharon, and they married in 1999. Despite his trauma from Kathy's death, James and Sharon traveled across the country, trying to move forward while the investigation loomed in the background. Sharon stood by James, insisting on his innocence and supporting him through the ongoing legal battles. The complexities of the Krausnet case highlighted the difficulties faced by law enforcement in solving cold cases. The investigation was a delicate balance of analyzing old evidence with new technologies, considering alternate theories, and navigating the legal and emotional intricacies involved. The persistent efforts of the investigators reflected their commitment to seeking justice for Kathy, despite the many obstacles they encountered. The case remained open, with investigators hoping that new breakthroughs in forensic science or fresh evidence would eventually lead to a resolution. In 2015, the investigation into Kathy Krausneck's murder was reignited with the support of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Advancements in forensic science and a fresh perspective on the evidence brought new hope for solving this decades-old case. The renewed investigation aimed to review all the evidence collected over the years and re-examine the interviews conducted with key witnesses. One of the primary focuses of the renewed investigation was the timeline of Kathy's death. The original autopsy had placed her time of death between 2.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m., but Dr. Michael Baden's reanalysis suggested she had likely died around 6.30 a.m. This crucial piece of information contradicted James's alibi and placed him at the scene during the likely time of the murder. Investigators meticulously reviewed the crime scene photos, forensic reports, and any new information that had come to light since the initial investigation. The FBI's involvement brought additional resources and expertise to the case. They re-examined the physical evidence using the latest forensic techniques, hoping to uncover new clues that had been missed previously. The team also conducted a comprehensive review of all interviews, looking for inconsistencies or details that might have been overlooked. In addition to the forensic re-examination, investigators also scrutinized James's behavior and actions before and after the murder. They analyzed his work records, personal life, and any potential motives that could explain why he might have committed the crime. This thorough review aimed to build a comprehensive picture of the events leading up to and following Kathy's death. The renewed investigation culminated in a grand jury indictment on November 8, 2019. James Krausneck was charged with second-degree murder. This decision was based on the cumulative evidence pointing towards his involvement in the crime. Despite the indictment, James maintained his innocence and pleaded not guilty. He was released on bail while awaiting trial. The indictment brought a mix of relief and renewed anxiety to those connected to the case. For Kathy's family, it represented a step towards justice, even though it had taken nearly four decades. For James and his supporters, 
It was another chapter in a long and painful ordeal. The legal proceedings that followed were closely watched by the public, reflecting the enduring interest and controversy surrounding the case. James's decision to voluntarily go to the police on November 8, 2019, highlighted his continued insistence on his innocence. He cooperated with the authorities, but never admitted guilt. This stance was consistent with his behavior throughout the investigation, where he had always maintained that he had no involvement in his wife's murder. As the case moved towards trial, both the prosecution and defense prepared to present their arguments. The prosecution focused on the inconsistencies in James's statements, the forensic evidence suggesting he was present at the time of the murder, and the suspicious circumstances surrounding his actions. The defense, on the other hand, aimed to highlight the lack of direct evidence, the possible involvement of alternate suspects like Edward Larrabee, and the impact of the flawed initial investigation. The reopening of the case in 2015 and the subsequent indictment in 2019 marked significant milestones in the long pursuit of justice for Kathy Krausneck. The legal process that followed was expected to finally bring clarity and resolution to a case that had haunted the Brighton community for decades. The renewed efforts by law enforcement underscored their commitment to solving the case, demonstrating the advancements in forensic science and the persistent quest for truth and justice. The legal proceedings in the case against James Krausneck began with intense scrutiny from both the public and the media. The trial, which took place nearly four decades after Kathy Krausneck's murder, was set to determine whether James was guilty of second-degree murder. The prosecution and defense prepared to present their arguments, each side hoping to sway the jury with their interpretation of the evidence. The prosecution's case centered around the idea that the crime scene had been meticulously staged to look like a burglary gone wrong. They argued that James's alibi did not hold up under closer examination and that the timeline suggested by Dr. Michael Baden's forensic analysis placed James at the scene at the time of the murder. Prosecutors highlighted the lack of forced entry, the absence of fingerprints, and the staged appearance of the house as key indicators that the crime had been carefully planned. Prosecutors also emphasized the findings of the renewed investigation, particularly Dr. Baden's conclusion that Kathy likely died around 6.30 a.m., the same time James claimed to have left for work. This crucial piece of evidence was used to challenge James's account and suggest that he had the opportunity and motive to commit the crime. The prosecution presented a narrative in which James, facing marital and work-related stresses, killed his wife and then staged the scene to cover his tracks. The defense, on the other hand, focused on the lack of direct evidence linking James to the murder. They pointed out that no physical evidence, such as fingerprints or DNA, tied James to the crime. The defense also highlighted the confession of Edward Larrabee, the convicted sex offender who had lived near the Krausnecks and had confessed to the murder shortly before his death. While Larrabee's confession was inconsistent and unreliable, the defense argued that it introduced reasonable doubt about James's guilt. Key testimonies during the trial came from a range of witnesses, including family members, friends, and forensic experts. Kathy's family testified about her relationship with James, their life together, and any signs of trouble they might have noticed. Friends and neighbors provided additional context about the couple's life in Brighton, describing them as a seemingly happy family, but noting the changes in Kathy's behavior before her death. Forensic experts, including Dr. Michael Baden, took the stand to explain the forensic evidence and the conclusions drawn from it. Dr. Baden's testimony was crucial in establishing the estimated time of death and the implications it had for James's alibi. Other experts discussed the lack of physical evidence at the scene and the possibility that the crime had been staged to mislead investigators. The trial proceedings were intense, with both sides presenting compelling arguments. The prosecution focused on the forensic evidence and the inconsistencies in James's statements, while the defense aimed to create doubt by highlighting the absence of direct evidence and presenting alternate theories. After several weeks of testimony and deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. On the basis of the cumulative evidence and the arguments presented, James Krausneck was found guilty of second-degree murder. The verdict was a significant moment in the case, bringing a sense of closure to some, but also sparking further debate among others. James was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. The sentencing marked the end of a long and arduous journey for justice in the case of Kathy Krausneck's murder. For Kathy's family, 
The verdict and sentencing brought a measure of justice and resolution, even though it had taken nearly 40 years to achieve. The trial and its outcome were closely followed by the public and the media. The case had drawn significant attention due to its complexity, the long passage of time, and the questions it raised about forensic science, legal procedures, and the nature of justice. The verdict was seen by many as a testament to the persistence of law enforcement and the advancements in forensic science that had made it possible to solve such an old case. James maintained his innocence throughout the trial and in the years that followed. His defense team filed appeals, arguing that the verdict was based on circumstantial evidence and that reasonable doubt had not been adequately considered. The appeals process continued, reflecting the ongoing legal battle and the divided opinions about James's guilt. The sentencing of James Krausneck to 25 years to life in prison marked a pivotal moment in the long quest for justice for Kathy Krausneck. It highlighted the challenges and complexities involved in solving cold cases and underscored the importance of forensic advancements and persistent investigative efforts. The case remains a poignant example of the impact of crime on families and communities and the enduring pursuit of truth and justice. The aftermath of the trial and the verdict in the case against James Krausnick brought a mix of emotions and reactions from those involved and the public. Kathy's family expressed relief and a sense of justice finally being served after nearly four decades. They believed that the guilty verdict against James provided some measure of closure, even though the pain of losing Kathy could never be fully alleviated. On the other hand, James's supporters, including his daughter Sarah, firmly maintained his innocence. Sarah, who had been just three years old at the time of her mother's death, stood by her father throughout the trial and its aftermath. She believed that James had been wrongfully convicted and that the true perpetrator had not been brought to justice. This unwavering support from his daughter was a significant source of strength for James as he faced his prison sentence and the ongoing legal battles. James's new wife, Sharon, also played a crucial role in supporting him during this tumultuous period. Sharon and James had married in 1999, and despite the trauma of James's past and the shadow of Kathy's murder, they had built a life together. Throughout the trial and its aftermath, Sharon publicly defended James, insisting on his innocence and describing him as a kind and supportive husband. Her steadfast belief in his innocence added another layer of complexity to the public's perception of the case. The case and its outcome also had a significant impact on public opinion. The divided views on James's guilt reflected the broader uncertainties and questions that remained unanswered. Some members of the public saw the verdict as a triumph of justice, made possible by advancements in forensic science and the dedication of law enforcement. Others, however, were skeptical of the evidence and remained unconvinced of James's guilt, viewing the case as an example of the potential flaws and limitations of the legal system. The extensive media coverage of the case played a significant role in shaping public opinion. Major news outlets, including Dateline, featured detailed reports on the investigation, the trial, and the subsequent verdict. These media portrayals highlighted the dramatic elements of the case, from the brutal nature of Kathy's murder to the decades-long quest for justice. In 2021, the case gained further attention with the release of a Netflix movie inspired by the events surrounding Kathy's murder. The film dramatized the investigation and the trial, bringing the story to a wider audience and reigniting public interest in the case. The portrayal of the case in popular media contributed to the ongoing discussions and debates about the evidence, the verdict, and the broader implications for the criminal justice system. The appeals process continued as James and his legal team sought to overturn the conviction. They argued that the verdict was based on circumstantial evidence and that the prosecution had not proven James's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The appeals highlighted the complexities and challenges involved in adjudicating cold cases, where the passage of time can obscure evidence and complicate the search for truth. As the legal battles continued, the case of Kathy Krausneck remained a poignant example of the enduring impact of violent crime on families and communities. It underscored the importance of advancements in forensic science and the persistence of law enforcement in seeking justice. At the same time, it also highlighted the potential for controversy and division when questions about guilt and innocence remain unresolved. The Krausenek case, with its mix of personal tragedy, forensic intrigue, and legal drama, 
will likely continue to be a topic of discussion and analysis for years to come. It serves as a reminder of the complexities and challenges inherent in the pursuit of justice and the ways in which such cases can profoundly affect the lives of those involved. Thank you for joining us today as we explored the complex and enduring case of Kathy Krausneck's murder. We hope this detailed look into the investigation, trial, and aftermath has provided a deeper understanding of the challenges faced in seeking justice. If you found this video informative and engaging, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others who might be interested. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay notified about our latest content. Your support helps us continue to bring you more true crime stories and in-depth analyses. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video. I have concerns my wife is trying to have me. Years later, her body was discovered. Describe this pain that still sits in the pit of my heart. Aid in to a serene view of Liberty Station, the gentle waters of San Diego Bay glittering under the sunlit sky. The peaceful scenery belies the turmoil that once unfolded here. This is where Elizabeth Sullivan, a 32-year-old mother of two, lived and was last seen alive in October 2014. Her life in San Diego, marked by her bright smile and charismatic presence, was darkened by shadows of domestic unrest and hidden fears. As we explore the corners and corridors of Liberty Station, we uncover the chilling story of Elizabeth's disappearance and the harrowing journey to unravel the truth. Elizabeth Sullivan, originally from Virginia, moved to San Diego after falling in love and marrying Matthew Sullivan, a United States Navy sailor. The bright California sun marked a fresh start for Elizabeth, but her new life was far from trouble-free. Known for her vibrant personality and infectious laughter, Elizabeth was a natural social butterfly, cherished by friends as much for her quick wit as for her empathetic nature. A mother of two young girls, she juggled parenting with personal aspirations. Elizabeth was creatively inclined, often channeling her thoughts and emotions into writing, which not only served as a refuge, but also hinted at her deeper turmoils. Her friends describe her as charismatic and fashionable, someone who could light up the room with her presence, yet who also struggled with the storms brewing behind her sunny facade. Her marriage, while initially filled with love, increasingly became a source of distress. Arguments and discord marked Elizabeth and Matthew's relationship with unresolved disputes about money, fidelity, and parenting. The marriage was further strained by Matthew's naval career, which often took him away from home, leaving Elizabeth to manage household responsibilities alone. In San Diego, Elizabeth found herself largely isolated, her life starkly contrasting with her vibrant public persona. Her interactions in the local community, though positive, were superficial, failing to provide the support she desperately needed. Behind closed doors, she faced Matthew's growing unpredictability and temper, which friends suggest could have been exacerbated by the pressures of his military duties and their marital issues. The move from Virginia to California, meant to be a new beginning, soon mirrored the confinement of her personal struggles as Elizabeth grappled with the duality of her external and internal worlds. Her life, full of potential and new beginnings, increasingly became overshadowed by loneliness and despair, setting the stage for her mysterious disappearance in October 2014. The vibrant, life-loving Elizabeth, adored by those who knew her best, found herself caught in a web of personal conflicts that concealed her growing fears and the threat they posed to her safety. Elizabeth Sullivan's disappearance in October 2014 came as a shocking and sudden blow to all who knew her. The events leading up to her vanishing trace, a timeline filled with routine days that spiraled into silent alarms. On October 13, 2014, Elizabeth was seen for the last time. That morning, like many others, began ordinarily as she took care of her young daughters at their home near Liberty Station. Neighbors saw her as usual, lively and engaged with her children, showing no signs of distress. Her husband, Matthew, was reportedly on shore duty, a brief pause in his otherwise demanding naval responsibilities. Throughout the day, Elizabeth was active on her phone, texting friends and family, sharing snippets of her day, and making plans for the upcoming weekend. Her last text message was sent around 3 p.m. After that, her phone activity ceased. Matthew claimed to return home later that evening to find the house quiet. Dinner started, but not finished, and no sign of Elizabeth. He told friends and the police that this wasn't the first time Elizabeth had left home after an argument, 
suggesting she might need some time alone. Matthew's narrative painted a picture of marital instability, hinting that Elizabeth's departure might have been voluntary. He reported her missing the next day, on October 14, 2014. In his call to the San Diego Police Department, he alternated between concern for his wife and insinuations about her mental health and purported need for solitude. Police initially treated the case with routine scrutiny. The search began at the Sullivan home and expanded to local areas Elizabeth was known to frequent. Her car was found parked in its usual spot, her wallet still at home. Interviews with friends and family pieced together Elizabeth's last confirmed whereabouts, but no one had seen or heard from her after that final text message. As days turned into weeks with no sign of Elizabeth, the community rallied with posters and volunteer searches. Meanwhile, investigators delved deeper into the Sullivans' lives, uncovering layers of discord beneath the surface of the couple's seemingly settled exterior. The lack of evidence at the home puzzled investigators, leaving more questions than answers in the early days of the investigation. The serene image of their daily life began to fracture, revealing a mosaic of complexities that hinted at more ominous possibilities than anyone had first imagined. When Elizabeth Sullivan vanished in October 2014, the response was swift and multifaceted. The San Diego Police Department initiated a standard missing person investigation, while the community and Elizabeth's friends launched an extensive search effort, underscored by a creeping sense of urgency and dread. From the onset, Matthew Sullivan's account to the police on October 14th suggested that Elizabeth might have left of her own volition, a narrative that painted her as possibly unstable and needing time away due to their marital strife. This perspective influenced the initial pace and nature of the investigation. The police began by searching the family home, where they found her belongings intact, her car in the garage, and no immediate signs of a struggle or departure. They canvassed the neighborhood, interviewing neighbors and local businesses, but no one reported seeing Elizabeth after the early afternoon of October 13th. Constant fights, and finally you just lost it and killed her with a knife. You know, that's what, clearly, what the, the law believes. No, I see what you're saying, Keith. I'm just saying, I mean, I was trying to do the right thing. Simultaneously, Elizabeth's friends and family were adamant that she would never leave her children willingly. They described her as a devoted mother and a vibrant person who was deeply embedded in her community. Their insistence on potential foul play pushed the police to consider more dire scenarios as days passed without a trace of her. Volunteers distributed flyers and organized search parties that combed the local areas where Elizabeth frequently visited. Social media campaigns sprung up, spreading her name and face far beyond San Diego, drawing attention to her mysterious disappearance. These community efforts kept the case in the public eye and added pressure on law enforcement to delve deeper. The police expanded their investigation to include reviewing Elizabeth's financial records, phone logs, and social media accounts. They re-interviewed Matthew multiple times, noting inconsistencies in his timeline of events. As the search extended from days into weeks, the police started to treat the case with the suspicion of foul play, slowly piecing together Elizabeth's last known hours and the troubled undercurrents of her marriage. The tension between the belief in her voluntary disappearance and the suspicion of foul play created a complex web of theories and potential leads. This period was marked by significant community involvement, which not only supported the ongoing investigation, but also highlighted the deep impact Elizabeth had made in her community. The urgency of these efforts reflected the hope and desperation of those who knew her, all clinging to the possibility that she might still be found alive. The dynamics within the Sullivan household were complex and fraught with tension, hinting at a troubled relationship long before Elizabeth's disappearance. Elizabeth and Matthew had been married for several years, but over time, their marriage had shown signs of strain that friends and family could not overlook. They argued frequently, mostly about Matthew's prolonged absences due to his naval career and Elizabeth's feeling of being left to manage their home and children alone. Neighbors often heard loud, disturbing arguments coming from the Sullivan home, suggesting an undercurrent of discord that Elizabeth masked in public with her bright smile. Friends reported that Elizabeth had expressed fears for her own safety in the months leading up to her disappearance. She confided in them about Matthew's unpredictable behavior and her plans to possibly leave him, fearing the marriage was beyond repair. In the initial stages of the investigation, Certain clues that would later prove to be critical were unfortunately overlooked. 
On the night of October 13, 2014, when Elizabeth was last seen, there was a brief sighting by a neighbor that was not immediately reported to the police. This sighting, which placed Elizabeth at the local park late at night, was initially dismissed as irrelevant. Additionally, several of Elizabeth's personal items, including her diary, were found in the home and initially not considered significant. Her diary, filled with entries about her marital troubles and fears, would later provide crucial insight into her state of mind before she vanished. The police also failed to thoroughly inspect the family computer and phone records during the first few days, missing early opportunities to track her last communications and movements. As weeks turned into months, these overlooked pieces of evidence became the cornerstone of the case, painting a picture of a woman living in fear and possibly planning to escape a life she felt was threatening her well-being. The early missteps in the investigation showed a tragic delay in understanding the gravity of the danger Elizabeth was in, complicating the effort to find her after she had disappeared. On October 6, 2016, nearly two years after Elizabeth Sullivan's disappearance, a grim discovery was made that reignited the case with a sense of urgency and horror. It was on this cool autumn morning that local joggers noticed an unusual object floating in the shallow waters of San Diego Bay near Liberty Station, not far from the Sullivan home. The object turned out to be the badly decomposed body of Elizabeth Sullivan. The police were immediately called to the scene, and the area quickly became the center of intense police activity. Years later, her body was discovered and her husband was convicted for murder. But there's much more to the story that will be shared. The location was particularly significant. It was a spot that Elizabeth was known to frequent for walks, and it was hauntingly close to the family's home. This proximity raised immediate questions about the circumstances of her disappearance and the efforts made to conceal her body. The San Diego Police Department, along with forensic experts, cordoned off the area, carefully retrieving the body and securing any potential evidence from the surrounding locale. Elizabeth Sullivan went missing in October 2014. No one knew what happened to her. Did she run away or was it something worse? Our missing persons unit uh, uh, did an extensive uh, investigation trying to, to find her, find out what happened uh, with her, uh, with, with, um, with negative results. Nearly two years later, on October 4th, 2016, police found a human body in the San Diego Bay. We went out there as, as a dead body. It was in a state of decomposition. Um, and then uh, through obviously uh, forensically, we were able to eventually identify the body as that of Elizabeth Sullivan. And it was just a few blocks from where Sullivan lived and police now suspect foul play. We believe she was murdered and I can't get into the details on how why we believe that it's an important part of our ongoing. The condition of Elizabeth's body indicated that she had been in the water for an extended period. Initial examinations suggested foul play and an autopsy later confirmed the cause of death as multiple stab wounds. The discovery shocked the community and the Sullivan family, shattering any lingering hopes that Elizabeth might still be alive. Reactions to the discovery were a mix of grief and outrage. Elizabeth's friends and family, who had spent countless hours searching and hoping for her safe return, were devastated. The police faced renewed scrutiny over their handling of the initial stages of the investigation, particularly why the Bay Area had not been thoroughly searched in the immediate aftermath of Elizabeth's disappearance. This significant find refocused investigative efforts and shifted the narrative from a missing person to a homicide. Detectives revisited old evidence and re-interviewed witnesses, now with the knowledge that Elizabeth had met a violent end. The pressure mounted to uncover how and why she ended up in San Diego Bay, and most importantly, who was responsible for her murder. The discovery of her body not only provided tragic answers, but also posed new questions that the police were determined to answer. As the community mourned, the resolve to seek justice for Elizabeth deepened, compelling law enforcement to unravel the mystery surrounding her untimely death. The case, once cold, was now red hot with leads to pursue and a killer to catch. As investigators delved into the forensic analysis, following the discovery of Elizabeth Sullivan's body, crucial evidence began to surface, providing the missing links needed to piece together the circumstances of her murder. At the forefront of this analysis was the discovery of a kitchen knife, which proved pivotal in connecting Matthew Sullivan to the crime. The knife, stained with Elizabeth's blood, was found hidden within the attic of the Sullivan home, a place few would have thought to look without the incentive of a thorough homicide investigation. 
The placement and concealment of the knife suggested premeditation and an attempt to obscure any link to the crime scene. Forensic experts tested the DNA on the blade and confirmed it matched Elizabeth's, definitively linking the weapon to her murder. Further examination of the Sullivan home brought to light more damning evidence. Beneath the living room carpet, investigators discovered traces of blood that had seeped through the floorboards. This blood was also tested, and the results confirmed it was Elizabeth's. The pattern and quantity of the blood suggested a violent struggle had occurred, countering Matthew's initial claims of Elizabeth leaving after a verbal altercation. The significance of these findings was profound. The blood evidence under the carpet indicated that not only had Elizabeth been attacked in her own home, but efforts had been made to clean up the scene, further implicating Matthew as he was one of the only people with access and opportunity to orchestrate such a cover-up. These forensic breakthroughs fundamentally shifted the trajectory of the investigation. They not only underscored the theory that Elizabeth had been murdered, but also pointed directly to Matthew having a direct role in her demise. With physical evidence establishing his connection to the murder weapon and the crime scene, the case against Matthew Sullivan began to solidify, guiding the police closer to securing justice for Elizabeth. The investigation had turned a crucial corner moving from speculative links to concrete evidence that could be presented in court. On January 31, 2018, Matthew Sullivan was arrested at his home in Delaware nearly four years after Elizabeth's disappearance and more than a year after her body was discovered. This arrest marked a critical turn in a case that had long puzzled investigators and haunted the San Diego community. Matthew's capture was the result of relentless police work and the accumulation of forensic evidence that placed him at the center of the investigation. The breakthroughs included the recovery of the knife used in the murder and the discovery of Elizabeth's blood in their home, which undermined Matthew's claims of innocence and his narrative that Elizabeth had left voluntarily. Elizabeth went missing in October 2014. No one knew what happened to her. Did she run away or was it something worse? Our missing persons unit uh, uh, did an extensive uh, investigation trying to, to find her, find out what happened uh, with her uh, with, with, um, with negative results. Nearly two years later, on October 4th, 2016, police found a human body in the San Diego Bay. We went out there as, as a dead body. It was in a state of decomposition. Um, and then uh, through obviously uh, forensically, we were able to eventually identify the body as that of Elizabeth Sullivan. And it was just a few blocks from where Sullivan lived and police now suspect foul play. We believe she was murdered and I can't give them the details on uh, why we believe that. It's an important part of our ongoing investigation. However, the most shocking revelation came from the details surrounding the method Matthew used to conceal Elizabeth's body. Investigators found that shortly after murdering Elizabeth, Matthew purchased a small freezer, which he used to hide her body within the garage of their Liberty Station home. This detail not only pointed to premeditation, but also indicated the lengths Matthew went to in order to prevent the discovery of his crime. The presence of the freezer was a damning piece of evidence that suggested a calculated effort to store the body temporarily while he planned its ultimate disposal in San Diego Bay. The use of the freezer added a macabre layer to the case illustrating the cold deliberateness of the act. This detail significantly influenced public and juridical perception, painting a picture of a calculated murderer rather than a spontaneous act of violence. Matthew's arrest brought a mix of relief and horror to those who knew Elizabeth. While it marked a significant step towards justice, it also brought to light the grim realities of her final days. As Matthew was taken into custody, the police and the community hoped to close a painful chapter while grappling with the chilling strategies employed to conceal this heinous crime. The case, now moving towards trial, promised to unveil further details of the dark strategies Matthew employed and to finally offer some semblance of justice for Elizabeth. This trial commenced on February 21, 2020, in a San Diego courtroom filled with tension and anticipation. The case had gripped the community, and now, Faced with a wealth of forensic evidence and the chilling details of his efforts to conceal his crime, Matthew stood accused of second-degree murder in the death of his wife, Elizabeth Sullivan. For this pain that still sits in the pit of my heart, show no mercy as he has shown no mercy on our angel. Along with the sentence, the judge ordered Matthew Sullivan to pay restitution fees. He has 60 days to appeal the ruling.
that became romantic and warm very quickly started to cool. Separate bedrooms, domestic violence, infidelity, financial issues, and threats of restraining orders. These are the hallmarks of a marriage in crisis. Prosecutors and defense attorneys presented their opening statements to a jury in the case against Matthew Sullivan. The former Navy sailor is facing a first degree murder charge for allegedly killing his estranged wife, Elizabeth Sullivan. Elizabeth's body was found in the San Diego Bay in 2016 after she reportedly disappeared in 2014. She was stabbed to death. And they found five different ribs on her left side, on her back that had nicks or cuts in them. Today, prosecutors revealed the alleged murder weapon, a knife. This is the evidence that shows you that the defendant is guilty of murder. He had lots of motive. He had the means. He had the opportunity. The crime scene was in her bedroom. The murder weapon was in the attic over his bedroom. The defense argued by bringing up Elizabeth's behavior and substance abuse. What started out as a glass of wine, became bottles of, of whiskey. What started out as marijuana became cocaine. What started out as amphetamine abuse turned into methamphetamine. Witnesses were called to the stand and were questioned on their relationship with Elizabeth. A judge asked us not to show their faces. If convicted, Matthew Sullivan could face 26 years to life behind bars. The prosecution presented a methodical case anchored by the forensic evidence painstakingly gathered over the years. The knife with Elizabeth's blood, found hidden in the attic, was displayed to the jury, a silent testament to the violence of the crime. The experts testified how the blood patterns under the carpet and in the living room were consistent with a struggle and attack, rather than an accidental injury or self-harm, countering one of the defense's potential arguments. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence was the freezer, used by Matthew to hide Elizabeth's body. The prosecution detailed how the purchase of the freezer shortly after Elizabeth's disappearance was premeditated, illustrating to the jury the lengths Matthew went to in trying to cover up his crime. They argued that his actions were calculated and deliberate, aiming to erase any traces of his involvement in her death. In contrast, the defense attempted to cast doubt on the integrity of the forensic evidence. They suggested that the time lapse between Elizabeth's disappearance and the discovery of her body could have compromised the DNA evidence. Furthermore, they portrayed Elizabeth as troubled, highlighting her supposed mental health issues and instability, suggesting that her lifestyle and personal choices might have led to her untimely death by other means. This portrayal was met with significant backlash, particularly from women's rights groups who saw it as an attempt to blame the victim. Testimonies from friends and family painted a different picture, one of a vibrant, loving mother whose life was brutally cut short. Elizabeth's friends refuted claims of her instability, describing her fears about Matthew's behavior and her plans to seek a divorce, plans that would never come to fruition. The trial also delved into the couple's troubled marriage, with evidence of multiple police calls to their home for domestic disturbances, further undermining Matthew's portrayal of Elizabeth as the instigator of their marital woes. As the trial progressed, the evidence seemed overwhelming. Every piece presented by the prosecution added to a narrative of control, violence, and deceit. The defense struggled to counter the weight of evidence, focusing instead on procedural discrepancies and the emotional and psychological defenses of a man they claimed was wrongfully accused. The community watched as the trial unfolded, hoping for justice for Elizabeth. The legal battle was not just about proving Matthew guilty, it was about vindicating Elizabeth, who had been silenced in such a tragic way. The trial promised to finally offer answers and accountability in a case that had long haunted those who knew and loved Elizabeth Sullivan. On March 12, 2021, after weeks of trial and extensive testimony, the courtroom was charged with a palpable tension as the jury returned to deliver their verdict in the case of Matthew Sullivan. The community, media, and especially Elizabeth's family and friends held their breath as the verdict was about to reshape many lives. Do you know when she's going to be returning home also? I, I have no idea. She leaves for hours, sometimes days at a time. A year after his sentence to prison, did you kill her? No, absolutely not. That's crazy. I've never laid a finger on her. I've never hit her. Nothing like that. 
Matthew Sullivan is sitting down with Dateline. The jury found Matthew Sullivan guilty of second-degree murder. The decision came after a day and a half of deliberation, which reflected the complexity of the case and the weight of the decision the jury had to make. The courtroom was heavy with emotion as the verdict was read. Relief and sorrow mingled in the air, reflecting the dual feelings of Elizabeth's loved ones. Relief that justice was served and profound sorrow that it would not bring Elizabeth back. Following the verdict, the emotional toll of the trial was palpable. Impact statements from Elizabeth's family were given, providing a heartbreaking insight into the devastation her murder had caused. Her mother, with tears staining her cheeks, spoke of the unfillable void left by her daughter's death and the pain of helping her grandchildren understand why their mother would never come home. Elizabeth's friends shared memories of her vibrancy and kindness, emphasizing the injustice of her untimely death. Judge Albert Haratunian did not mince words when it came time to sentence Matthew. He condemned Matthew's actions in stark terms, highlighting the premeditation and cruelty involved in the crime. He spoke directly to Matthew, criticizing him for the cold and calculated manner in which he executed the crime and attempted to cover it up. The judge sentenced him to 16 years to life in prison, a sentence that underscored the gravity of his actions, but did little to ease the pain of those left behind. The conclusion of the trial did not mark the end of grief for Elizabeth's family and friends, but it did bring a sense of closure to the legal aspect of her death. The community could only hope that the verdict would serve as a deterrent to similar crimes, bringing some sense of justice and honor to Elizabeth's memory. As the courtroom emptied, the emotional toll of the trial lingered, a somber reminder of the life lost and the lives forever altered. The trial of Matthew Sullivan closed a chapter on a saga of violence and loss that gripped the community, but it also opened a conversation about broader issues of domestic violence and the often silent battles many endure within the confines of their homes. Elizabeth Sullivan's murder, tragic and brutal, brought to light the stark realities of domestic abuse and the critical need for awareness and proactive interventions. The verdict, while bringing legal closure, served also as a poignant reminder of the person at the center of this story, a beloved mother, a treasured friend, a vibrant community member. Elizabeth was remembered not just for the circumstances of her death, but for the life she led, her aspirations, and the indelible impact she had on those around her. Her life story, marred by violence, became a rallying cry for those who advocate for victims of domestic abuse, underscoring the importance of recognizing the signs and taking action. The trial's outcome also underscored the importance of support systems for those affected by domestic violence, the need for effective legal protections, and the critical role of community awareness in preventing such tragedies. It highlighted the changes needed in how society responds to domestic violence, including better support for survivors, more thorough investigations of abuse allegations, and continued education on the issues surrounding domestic abuse. Elizabeth's memory is honored through ongoing advocacy and awareness efforts that aim to protect others from similar fates. Foundations and community groups have been motivated by her story to push for legislative changes and to provide more comprehensive support for victims of domestic violence. Her story has inspired annual gatherings and memorials that not only remember her, but also affirm community commitment to fighting against domestic violence. As Elizabeth's story continues to influence and inspire change, it serves as a powerful reminder of the human cost of domestic violence and the urgent need for community action. Her legacy lives on in the lives saved and improved through these efforts. The reflections on her life and the circumstances of her death ensure that while she was a victim, Elizabeth Sullivan is remembered for much more. She epitomizes resilience, the will to protect one's family, and the enduring strength of the human spirit. Elizabeth Sullivan's tragic death resonated deeply within her community and beyond, becoming a catalyst for heightened awareness and action against domestic violence. Her story has inspired a significant shift in how the community addresses this pervasive issue, highlighting the need for greater support and resources for victims. In the wake of her death, local community leaders, along with activists and volunteers, established the Elizabeth Sullivan Memorial Fund, which aims to support domestic violence victims through education, legal assistance, and direct support services. This fund also works to educate the public about the signs of domestic abuse 
and the best ways to support those who may be suffering in silence. Furthermore, Elizabeth's story has prompted local schools to implement programs that teach young people about healthy relationships, consent, and the importance of speaking out against abuse. These educational initiatives are Elizabeth's legacy, empowering the next generation with the knowledge and tools to prevent violence in their own relationships. Annual walks and vigils are now held in Elizabeth's memory, serving as communal platforms for solidarity, healing, and raising awareness. These events not only honor Elizabeth, but also provide a space for survivors to share their stories and for the community to affirm its commitment to eradicating domestic violence. Through these efforts, Elizabeth's impact continues to influence lives, shaping a safer, more aware community. As the gavel fell on the final verdict of Matthew Sullivan's trial, it marked not just the conclusion of a legal battle, but also the beginning of healing for those affected by Elizabeth Sullivan's tragic death. Justice, in this case, was served through the diligence of law enforcement, the forensic experts, and the unwavering voices of Elizabeth's loved ones, who advocated tirelessly for truth and accountability. The pain of loss is profound and enduring. Elizabeth's death leaves a void in the hearts of her family and friends that can never be filled. Yet, in the face of this irrevocable loss, there is remarkable resilience. The strength of a community that rallied to support the bereaved and the courage of individuals who, inspired by Elizabeth's story, now fight to prevent such tragedies from befalling others. This documentary has traversed the emotional landscapes of grief, outrage, hope, and resolve, reflecting the complex nature of human relationships and the sometimes painful pursuit of justice. Through Elizabeth's story, we are reminded of the critical importance of community vigilance, the need for robust support systems for domestic violence victims, and the powerful impact of collective action. In remembering Elizabeth, we celebrate her life as much as we mourn her loss, and we commit to carrying forward her legacy in ways that affirm life, dignity, and justice for all. As we move forward, let us take with us the lessons learned from this painful yet poignant journey, holding on to the hope that from the darkest of times, there can emerge light and renewal. On December 25, 2017, Oak Bay, a quiet seaside community in Victoria, Canada, sparkled under the festive lights of Christmas. Homes lined the streets, each window aglow with the soft light of decorated trees and colorful displays of Santa Claus and reindeer. The air, usually brisk and filled with the scent of winter, carried the laughter and chatter of families celebrating the season. Yet, this picturesque setting was starkly disrupted by the piercing sound of police sirens that evening. The sirens converged on a modest family home, the residence of Sarah Cotton. What was meant to be a night of joyous celebrations had taken a dark turn. The flashing blue and red lights cast long, ominous shadows across the snow-covered lawn, hinting at the gravity of the situation unfolding inside. Neighbors, drawn by the commotion, watched from their doorways, a mix of concern and curiosity etched on their faces. As the community nestled in the safety of their warm homes, Sarah's house stood eerily silent. The usual cheer of the holiday was overshadowed by a growing sense of dread. What happened in this seemingly peaceful home to draw such urgent attention from the authorities on Christmas Day? Sarah Cotton grew up in Victoria, Canada, where she established her roots in a community known for its closeness and scenic beauty. She was a bright and ambitious woman, characterized by her warm smile and a keen interest in communication and public relations. After graduating from the University of Victoria in 2005, she quickly stepped into the professional world, securing an internship that paved the way for her future career in communications. By 2007, Sarah had joined the Tartan Group, a well-respected public relations firm, where she excelled and quickly made a name for herself through her dedication and the quality of her work. Her early successes in her career were not just a testament to her skills, but also to her genuine passion for connecting with people and telling stories that mattered. Family was always central to Sarah's life. She was particularly close to her father, who was not only a loving parent, but also her greatest supporter. His guidance and protection were constant throughout her life, providing a foundation of security and confidence that Sarah drew upon in all areas of her life. His sudden death in a car accident in 2013 was a devastating blow that shook the very core of her existence, 
leaving a void that was difficult to fill. The loss deeply affected Sarah, altering her outlook and emotional resilience. It was during this vulnerable time that her relationship with Andrew, whom she had met and married several years prior, began to show signs of strain. The changes in Sarah's life set the stage for a tumultuous period that would challenge her in ways she had never anticipated. Sarah first crossed paths with Andrew Barry in 2009, while they both worked at British Columbia Ferries, a public company providing transport between the mainland and coastal islands of British Columbia. Their initial connection was sparked by mutual interests and shared experiences at work, quickly blossoming into a romantic relationship. Sarah found Andrew's charm and seemingly laid-back attitude refreshing, and it wasn't long before their casual dating evolved into something more serious. In 2010, buoyed by a year of happy memories and shared dreams, Andrew proposed, and Sarah accepted without hesitation. They married in a modest ceremony in Victoria, surrounded by close family and friends. The couple's union marked the beginning of what Sarah envisioned as a lifelong partnership, filled with love, support, and mutual respect, a foundation they hoped to build their future family upon. The birth of Chloe in 2011, and then Aubrey in 2013, brought immense joy to Sarah and Andrew's lives. The couple, now parents, initially embraced their new roles with enthusiasm. However, the demands of parenthood began to reveal cracks in their relationship. Andrew's demeanor changed gradually, his once easygoing nature giving way to moments of unpredictability and frustration. Sarah, deeply committed to her children's well-being, often found herself mediating to maintain peace at home. The situation deteriorated further following the unexpected death of Sarah's father in late 2013. His passing removed a crucial pillar of emotional support from Sarah's life, deeply affecting her resilience and mental state. Her father had been a buffer against Andrew's growing unpredictability, and without him, the household dynamics shifted significantly. Andrew's behavior became increasingly difficult for Sarah to manage, especially as she dealt with her own grief. By 2014, the relationship faced severe strains as Andrew's temper led to verbal altercations that often occurred in front of the children. The environment at home, once a haven for Sarah, began to feel tense and unstable. As the foundation of their marriage weakened, Sarah's efforts to keep the family unit intact became more challenging, setting the stage for further conflicts that would eventually push the couple to their breaking point. Tensions in Sarah and Andrew's marriage reached a critical point in early 2015. Andrew's aggression escalated beyond harsh words to physical confrontations. A particularly alarming incident occurred in April 2015 when an argument spiraled out of control. Andrew, in a fit of rage, pinned Sarah against the wall and began choking her. Terrified, Sarah managed to break free and called the police. This marked a turning point for Sarah, realizing that the safety of herself and her children was at stake. Following the choking incident, Sarah took decisive action. She obtained a restraining order that legally barred Andrew from coming near her or the children. With the law on her side, she felt a temporary relief, but the ordeal was far from over. In the months that followed, the couple initiated divorce proceedings. The process was fraught with challenges, primarily centered around custody of Chloe and Aubrey. The court battles were lengthy and emotionally draining. Sarah fought to ensure that Andrew's access to the children was limited, arguing his unpredictable behavior made him a risk to their safety. The divorce was finalized later that year, granting Sarah full custody of the children, while Andrew was allowed supervised visits only. The court mandated Andrew to pay child support, an obligation he met inconsistently, adding further strain to the post-divorce dynamics. This period marked a new chapter of independence for Sarah, who was determined to rebuild a safe and stable life for her daughters. After their separation and divorce in 2015, Sarah and Andrew entered into a contentious period over the custody of Chloe and Aubrey. The initial custody agreement allowed Andrew only supervised visits, reflecting the court's concerns over his past aggressive behavior. Despite the supervision, these visits were a source of ongoing stress for Sarah, who remained vigilant about the safety of her daughters. The legal battles also extended into financial areas, particularly over child support and the division of property. Andrew was inconsistent in making child support payments, complicating Sarah's financial situation as she strived to provide for Chloe and Aubrey. The court's involvement became necessary to enforce these payments, 
adding layers of legal disputes to the already strained relationship between Sarah and Andrew. In 2016, another significant legal decision was made regarding the family home. The court ordered Andrew to sell his share of the property to Sarah at a reduced price. The cost of share of the property was $60,000, and Andrew was ordered to sell it for $20,000, considering the outstanding child support. This decision was intended to alleviate some of the financial burden on Sarah while ensuring the children's home environment remained stable. Andrew, however, was displeased with this arrangement, viewing it as unfair and financially disadvantageous. These ongoing legal disputes were not only financially draining, but also emotionally taxing for both parties. The constant back and forth in court, the need for lawyers, and the scrutiny of private family matters added significant stress to Sarah's life. Yet, she remained focused on securing a safe and stable future for her daughters, fighting tirelessly to keep Andrew's influence limited and their living situation secure. The legal battles, while challenging, were a necessary evil to protect her daughters from the instability that Andrew's behavior could bring into their lives. Sarah celebrated her birthday on December 21, 2017, a day filled with small joys and the laughter of her daughters, Chloe and Aubrey. The birthday was marked by a cozy gathering at home where Chloe and Aubrey helped their mother blow out the candles, their faces lit with excitement. This family celebration was a brief respite from the ongoing challenges Sarah faced, allowing them all to relish in moments of togetherness and love. With her birthday behind her, Sarah turned her attention to preparing for Christmas. She decorated their home with care, hanging stockings, setting up a beautifully adorned Christmas tree, and wrapping presents that sat under the tree, waiting to be opened by excited little hands. Each decoration added to the festive atmosphere, but also weighed on Sarah's heart, as she knew the girls would soon be spending part of their Christmas with Andrew. On the morning of December 25th, 2017, Sarah drove Chloe and Aubrey to Andrew's house. As she prepared to leave them there, her emotions were conflicted. She felt uneasy about Andrew's ability to care for their daughters, especially given his past behavior and the current strains in their interactions. Despite the court's assurances and supervised visitation arrangements, Sarah couldn't shake off a deep-seated worry for her daughter's well-being. As she hugged Chloe and Aubrey goodbye, Sarah tried to mask her concern with a smile, encouraging them to enjoy their time with their father. She reminded them that she would see them soon, holding back her anxiety as she waved them off at the doorstep. Driving away, Sarah's car became quieter, the absence of her daughter's palpable. She felt a knot in her stomach, a mother's intuition that something was amiss as she headed back to an empty home to wait for their return. On the afternoon of December 25, 2017, as Christmas celebrations continued across Oak Bay, a shadow fell over Sarah's heart. Chloe and Aubrey were due back at noon, but the clock ticked past the hour with no sign of them or a call from Andrew. Sarah's initial worry quickly turned into alarm. She called Andrew's phone multiple times, each call met with silence. No answer came, not even a text. Her attempts to reach him through other means, including messages and emails, also went unanswered. Frustrated and increasingly anxious, Sarah decided she could wait no longer. Accompanied by her mother, she drove back to Andrew's house. As they approached, the lack of festive lights and the silence around the property contrasted sharply with the vibrant holiday spirit seen elsewhere in the neighborhood. The unease deepened when repeated knocks on Andrew's door went unanswered. Peering through the windows revealed nothing. The house appeared unusually still, almost as if abandoned. Sarah's mother suggested they speak with the neighbors. One neighbor recalled hearing laughter from the children in the morning, but noted it had abruptly stopped around noon. Another mentioned hearing unusual noises, like thuds, bangs, and screams, which they had initially dismissed as holiday revelry. With each passing moment, Sarah's worry turned to panic. Realizing the severity of the situation, Sarah dialed 911. The police arrived swiftly. An officer approached the house, finding the front door unlocked. Stepping inside, the festive air gave way to a chilling scene. The entryway was dim, the air stale. Switching on his flashlight, the officer's beam cut through the darkness, revealing a horrifying scene. The walls and floor were smeared with blood, traces leading down the hallway. Following the grim trail, the officer entered the living room, where the Christmas tree stood ironically adorned next to scenes of apparent violence. The search led to the bedrooms. 
In one, he found a lifeless Chloe lying on her bed, surrounded by blood-soaked gifts. The room was in disarray, bloody, with signs of a desperate struggle. In another bedroom, Aubrey was discovered under similar tragic circumstances, her small body also bearing signs of violence. The officer urgently called for backup, his voice tense over the radio. Additional police units and medical responders were dispatched as the home became a crime scene. The discovery was relayed to Sarah, who was waiting outside, gripped by a mix of hope and dread. When informed of the devastating news, her world shattered. The street filled with the sounds of Christmas was starkly contrasted by her heart-wrenching screams, mourning the unimaginable loss of her daughters. Meanwhile, the police found Andrew in the bathroom, barely alive, with injuries that appeared self-inflicted. His throat was cut, several stabs on the area of his chest, similar to the type of stabs Chloe and Aubrey had. Each of his breaths came in heavier than the last. He was quickly attended to by paramedics who provided first aid before rushing him to the hospital where he was placed under police guard. His survival meant that he could potentially provide answers to the many questions about what had happened to Chloe and Aubrey. After confirming the situation, the officer who first entered secured the area to ensure no further danger. Additional police and forensic units arrived promptly, setting up a perimeter to preserve the integrity of the crime scene. The forensic team began their meticulous work, documenting every detail, photographing the scene, and collecting physical evidence that could help explain the sequence of events leading to the children's deaths. In the living room and bedrooms, evidence of a struggle was apparent. Toys and gifts were scattered, some stained with blood, telling a silent, harrowing story of the children's last moments. The forensic team carefully collected samples of blood, fingerprints, and fibers, focusing on the bloody bat found near Chloe and the knife wounds on both children, which were consistent with the kitchen knives taken from Andrew's home. As the investigation unfolded inside, Sarah, kept back by police at a safe distance, struggled to comprehend the news of her daughter's deaths. Her anguish filled the cold Christmas air, a stark contrast to the laughter and light of other homes celebrating the day. Family members and friends arrived, drawn by the news, forming a tight circle around her, trying to offer comfort in the face of overwhelming grief. Sarah's reaction was a visceral portrait of a mother's worst nightmare unfolding in real time. In the aftermath of the tragic events on December 25, 2017, the focus swiftly shifted to gathering and processing evidence to piece together the sequence of events that led to the deaths of Chloe and Aubrey Berry. Forensic teams were meticulous in their approach, collecting blood samples, fingerprints, and DNA from the scene. Each item was carefully cataloged to build a comprehensive picture of the crime. The autopsies on Chloe and Aubrey were conducted promptly. The results were heart-wrenching. Chloe had suffered multiple blunt force traumas to her head, which were fatal, along with numerous stab wounds across her body. She was struck hard with a bat, found near her body covered in blood. Her skull was broken. 26 stab wounds were found on her body. The main cause of her death was loss of blood. Aubrey's autopsy revealed a similar brutal attack with 32 stab wounds, which also caused fatal bleeding. The nature and multiplicity of their injuries indicated a deliberate and sustained attack, which was particularly difficult for all involved to come to terms with. The exact time of their deaths was not possible to identify. It seemed like Andrew stabbed the front and back side of the girls separately, turning them around. Meanwhile, Andrew Barry was found in a critical condition with self-inflicted wounds, suggesting an attempted suicide. He was rushed to hospital, where he was stabilized and placed under intensive care. His injuries included a deep cut to his throat and several stabs to his chest. As he lay hospitalized, guarded by police, the question of his motive and the sequence of events that led him to harm his own daughters became central to the investigation. The evidence gathered from the home and the medical examinations formed the basis of the case against Andrew. The findings from the crime scene were consistent with a violent struggle taking place, contradicting any initial thoughts of an outside intruder. As Andrew began to recover from his injuries, the police prepared to question him, seeking answers that would clarify the events that transpired in that tragic Christmas setting. The investigation into the tragic deaths of Chloe and Aubrey also brought to light Andrew Barry's personal struggles, particularly his escalating gambling addiction, which became severe after his separation from Sarah. 
His addiction to gambling was not just a personal vice. It had significant financial problems. After losing his job, Andrew's financial stability crumbled, plunging him into deep debt. He was known to frequent casinos, and his financial desperation grew as he borrowed money, unable to keep up with his losses. This financial desperation was highlighted during the trial through evidence and testimonies about Andrew's debts. It was revealed that he owed substantial amounts to various creditors, which some initially speculated might have provided a motive for someone he owed to be involved in the tragic events. However, as the trial progressed, forensic evidence firmly pointed to Andrew as the perpetrator, proving the theory of an outside involvement. On Christmas Eve 2017, a glimpse into a seemingly ordinary family moment was captured. Camera footage showed Andrew Barry shopping with his daughters, Chloe and Aubrey. The video, recorded just hours before the tragic events, depicted them moving through the aisles, picking out last-minute holiday supplies. Another poignant piece of evidence was a letter found at the scene, addressed to Andrew's sister. In the letter, written as if it were his last, Andrew expressed deep frustrations and resentments towards Sarah, blaming her for his troubles. He wrote about feeling betrayed and cornered, providing a chilling insight into his state of mind before the murders. By his letter, he still loved his wife and his daughters. He did not want to live anymore, but also did not want to leave the world without his beloved daughters. This letter explained Andrew's motives. The prosecution used this letter to argue that Andrew's actions were premeditated, stemming from a place of anger and despair. After weeks of emotional testimonies and rigorous examination of evidence, the trial reached its climax. On a solemn day in late 2018, the jury delivered their verdict. Andrew Barry was found guilty of two counts of second-degree murder for the deaths of his daughters, Chloe and Aubrey. The courtroom, filled with tense anticipation, let out a collective, subdued sigh as the verdict was read. Some wept softly, others simply nodded, their expressions a mixture of relief and sorrow. The sentencing phase followed shortly after the conviction. The judge sentenced Andrew to life in prison, with no possibility of parole for 22 years. This decision was met with mixed reactions. While some felt that justice had been served, others, especially those close to Sarah and her daughters, thought that the sentence could never truly compensate for the loss of Chloe and Aubrey. The community, which had followed the case closely and supported Sarah throughout the trial, continued to show their solidarity. The local newspapers and social media were filled with opinions, condolences, and calls for changes to how such cases are handled in the future. The tragic end of two young lives not only left a permanent mark on those who knew them, but also on the community that mourned the loss of innocence in such a brutal, heart-wrenching way. No one could predict that a second chance would lead to that. Thank you for joining us in remembering Chloe and Aubrey and reflecting on this poignant story. It is our hope that sharing their story will contribute to heightened awareness and prevention of such tragedies in the future. For now, take care of yourselves and each other and keep the spirit of compassion and vigilance alive in your communities.